Hello and welcome to the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Hartz, and today we are going to break down the entire Week 9 NFL slate. We got still got some bye weeks out there, but 14 more uh, great games to be looking at. All sorts of injury news, not as much uh, you know trade news as maybe we expected uh, here on trade deadline day, but uh, plenty to talk about regardless. So, have a very special guest. You guys know him already. It's PFF's Andrew Erickson on again. Usually got this dude on every two weeks, and please check him out on uh, Sundays from 7 to 9 p.m. on SiriusXM. Fancy Sports Radios. I host a 5 to 7 uh, uh, show on Saturday. And, you know, we usually go on each other's shows because Andrew and I enjoy talking football with each other. Andrew, what's going on, man? Yeah, dude. Can't get enough of Ian and Andrew just talking about football all the time. Just two dudes, you know, talking ball. But, yeah, man, I'm excited. It's been, you know, a tremendous, you know, week couple eight weeks of football I, I checked out all my fantasy teams and i'm 500 across the board every seasonal team it all lands to 500 so we'll see how the that the second half ends up shaping up guys being dude let's get those 500 teams on the up and up try to get everyone <laughs> listening everyone talking into championship sunday feeling good about themselves so without further ado let's get into week nine. First matchup we got the packers at the 49ers seeing the packers open as four point favorites now they're up to five you know after some of the 49er injury news over under is down from 52 to 50 so you know As someone that spent the majority of my Monday night writing an article about Will Fuller being traded to the Packers, that did not happen, Andrew. And it's very frustrating when these (laughs) things do happen in our lives. And look, I understand I get to cover football for a living. Very blessed. My, uh, you know, small kind of daily obstacles of people yelling at me on Twitter, you know, are problems I will happily take rather than go back into the world of finance. But either way, just have a couple of Will Fuller stats I wanted to pull out, even though he's not on the member of the Green Bay Packers. With Will Fuller, Deshaun Watson has averaged 8.74 8.74 yards per attempt, 7.26 yards per attempt without. We've even seen DeAndre Hopkins when he was playing with Fuller. He averaged 8.2 yards per target with Fuller, 7.5 without. Will Fuller literally makes your entire offense better, and I think he would have continued to be an upside wide receiver too in Green Bay in Houston. His 22% rate of being open or wide open on targets thrown at least 20 yards down the field, that's tied for 10th with Tyree Kill since he's entered the league. He truly is that special with field stretching talent, and the fact that the Packers have again declined to add anybody to their wide receiver room is so frustrating. It's been Reggie Bagleton, Devin Funches, and that is it throughout his entire offseason and now into the regular season. So just criminal. There's only so much Devontae Adams can do. We've seen the rest of these guys, and guess what? It's not much. So, you know, Alan Lazard's coming back. That's great. He's, you know, flashed more than most of the other guys. But now we got A.J. Dillon, Jamal Williams going through COVID protocols. We got Aaron Jones seeming more on the doubtful side with a calf injury. Like, there just literally is nobody for Aaron Rodgers to throw the ball to. And guess what? He somehow managed to overcome this from most of the season, but it really is criminal what they're asking uh, him to do uh, in this offense. You know, quickly on the running back system. Sorry for wasting so much time on Will Fuller, everybody, but had to get some of those thoughts out. Quickly on the running back situation, it's going to be Dexter Williams and Tyler Irvin. Irvin has played 104 out of his 108 snaps this season in the slot or out wide. Like they use him more as a wide receiver, but a lot of times they do that uh, to get him the ball as a runner. So I do think, you know, Irvin, he's a guy that even you go back to playoffs last year, like they have prioritized getting Tyler Irvin the ball uh, over the these past two seasons far more uh, than Dexter Williams who had zero touches this year and only five carries last year so I think we're gonna see Aaron Rodgers throw the hell out of the ball and I think uh, Tyler Irvin being the likely pass down back will be the preferred fantasy back to own not gonna get too crazy with you no know, ranking him in the top 10 or 12 like we will with Jamal or Aaron but I do think you know uh, Tyler Irvin is someone that we could you know treat as a lower end RB2 ahead of this matchup based on volume and hopefully uh, fantasy friendly pass game volume Andrew what's up with the 49ers yeah, it definitely makes sense to lean probably towards Tyler Irving. I know I tweeted out something about Dexter Williams, but kind of just doing a little more digging. It seems like Tyler Irving, because again, you want the pass game usage. The 49ers still have a pretty decent run defense, and that's the value they throw to their backs. And Irving has played, like you said, and, and Dexter Williams really hasn't. But at the 49ers, again, they are dealing with a lot of injuries on their side of the ball too. Not COVID-related necessarily, but they are the walking wounded essentially. So you got a two-man backfield now with Tevin Coleman back on the injured reserve, you know, where he frequently stays, Jamichael Hasty and Jarek McKinnon. And the way that's kind of shaping up, it seems like to me, it's going to be Jamichael Hasty is going to be the guy that I would prefer in this matchup. Again, the Green Bay Packers run defense is absolutely atrocious. We saw them, you know, last week, again, Dalvin Cook absolutely went off. The Packers have allowed the most fantasy points per game to running backs through seven weeks. And we've seen the 49ers offense flex their running game all over this Packers defense in the past. 
Seems like just yesterday, Raheem Mostert posted 220 rushing yards against the Packers back in the NFC Championship game. So I'm firing up Jermichael Hasty with confidence. Again, he wasn't playing the majority of snaps in that game, but he was seeing the majority of carries on early downs. That's really his role, and I think is where the most value is. Again, I still think Jarek McKinnon, I think the 49ers are half to use him. They got to wake up his legs. They need to get him going, get some coffee, you know, inject those into those legs, and they got to use him because they're just a lack of playmakers on that offense. And the Green Bay Packers haven't been great at defending running backs in the passing game. Packers this season rate dead last in pass rating allowed, 129.9, and yards per target, 8.8 to the running back position. So I like Hasty, but if you're desperate, I still think McKinnon can still be a viable option as well. Taking three injuries to get there, but yes, it is finally a time where we can uh, look to Hasty for some legit uh, fantasy football upside. Next matchup, we got the Texans at the Jaguars. Texans holding steady as seven point favorites. Uh, Over under is sitting at about 51. So, look, in 20, I just want to point out that Deshaun Watson, you know, even without DeAndre Hopkins, even with Bill O'Brien getting fired halfway through the season, even, you know, without the defense really doing any, doing him or the offense any favors uh, throughout the year, he has literally been as productive as we have ever seen him. 2017, he really took the league by storm as a rookie, 24.1 fantasy points per game. 2018, he goes down to 20.7. 2019, back up to 21.3. And now in 2020, he is sitting at 22.1 fantasy points per game. Deshaun Watson truly is playing the most efficient football of his career. We aren't seeing him run the ball quite as much, but really just the only issue has been there's been more quarterbacks than usual kind of averaging in the mid-20s in the fantasy points per game. So Deshaun Watson, while he's been ranking, you know, really in the top three or four guys over the past three years, even though he's averaging more this season. I believe he's eighth among quarterbacks and fantasy points per game, but don't get it twisted. He is playing as good as ever, and now that Will Fuller is still in his good graces, we can continue to expect him to have, you know, plenty of weapons at his disposal. So, you know, this week in this this prime matchup, only the Seahawks and Falcons have allowed more fantasy points per game to opposing QBs and the Jaguars. Look, if you have Kyler Murray, Russell Wilson, or Patrick Mahomes, you're starting them ahead of Deshaun Watson. Otherwise, I want Watson. I want Watson over Josh Allen. I want Watson over Lamar Jackson, Justin Herbert, any of these guys cake matchup he's playing great don't overthink it Andrew what's up with the Jaguars if anything man other than James Robinson because I, I love that guy <laughs> yeah obviously James Robinson is in a absolute smash spot but again you know Sean Watson he's got Will Fuller man so he's a winner from today he didn't lose him so he has him against the Jaguars so you got absolutely gotta love that but when it comes to the Jaguars man we're gonna you got Oregon State's finest coming in making his NFL debut in Jake Luton Luton, however you pronounce it, uh, he's going to be filling in for the injured guarder Minshew and kind of looking at what he did in college, you know, he has the arm talent to deliver the deep ball, but he's really more of a check down specialist, you know, looking through some of his read ups here up on PFF.com. It's really been, hey, he's risk adverse. He's got a little bit of Alex Smith in him. So that's kind of what we're dealing with. He's someone that isn't going to turn the ball over necessarily. And I'm assuming they're going to game plan around that. They're going to be like, hey, we're going to run the football because you can run the football against the Houston Texans. So again, Luton, just nine turnover worthy plays last year and zero fumbles. So this may tamper any expectations of you got to fire up Houston's DST because number one, Houston's defense is not good. And number two, just because he's a rookie quarterback doesn't mean that he's automatically going to be a turnover machine. Not everybody is Daniel Jones. So that being said, I am a little bit concerned about DJ Chark in this matchup. He's really thrived as a downfield downfield receiver throughout his career. And he's already kind of been inconsistent. So I get, you know, arguments come out and say, oh, well, you know, he's better with Luton under center and not Gardner Minshew. I'm like, okay, well, he's a worse quarterback. So I, I don't know if I'm going to buy that necessarily. I mean, Chark has already been inconsistent. And to say now we have a Alex Smith taking under center who doesn't have Andy Reid as his OC, I don't think he's going to unleash it downfield. So I don't like Chark in this spot. And again, even this matchup earlier in the year, you know, Chark struggled. He had three catches on four targets. He's going to be shattered by Bradley Roby, who again, is not the greatest cornerback in the world, but he played well against him last time. And the Texans don't go away from this shadow coverage when Roby got hurt. They shadowed other guys in Devontae Adams. Chark is not Devontae Adams. So I'm sorry, <laughs> as much as we like him to be. But the guy I do like because of the check down nature of Luton is LaVishka Chenault. Because Chenault had his best game against the Houston Texans this season. Eight targets, seven catches, and 79 yards. The Chenault is also averaging 4.9 yards per carry. The Houston Texans can't stop the run. Chenault is going to get a couple carries here and there. He could break one off. So his average depth of target is 5.8, ranked 69th, nice, out of 70 qualifying receivers this season behind Larry Fitzgerald. But Chanel has juice. So I think that he's actually going to be probably the leading receiver. He'll probably be my my highest ranked Jaguar uh, heading into this game, besides James Robinson, of course.
Yeah, I, I don't hate that call. And, you know, Chark is good enough to maybe overcome this situation in a decent matchup. But I think in general, people, you know, with the Cowboys, the Jaguars, and the Dolphins, these teams we're seeing just with, you know, just – either atrocious or just uneven quarterback play under center. We have Gaskin with the Dolphins. We have Robinson with the Jaguars. We kind of have Zeke with the Cowboys. That's literally it in terms of guys that should, you know, definitively be in your starting lineups. So well, I know we'll talk more about, the, you know, the other situations moving forward, but truly, you know, if there's a kind of a close start sick question, give me a team that has a quarterback that we at least know can move the ball down the field, and that is not the Jacksonville Jaguars, Cowboys, or Dolphins at the moment. Uh, moving on here, we got the Giants at the Washington football team. Giants are coming in three uh, three point underdogs to the football team over under down from 43 to 41 and a half. So, with the Giants, I mean, if you watch that Monday night game, so Darius Slayton, he had his usual uh, kind of big, big crop of air yards. He gets fed air yards all freaking season. Only Terry McLaurin at 46%, Adam Thielen at 41%, and DJ Moore 41%. Join Slayton as receivers with at least 40% of their team's air yard share. So, this is great. And I understand, you know, we've seen some uneven production from uh, McLaurin and even DJ Moore as well. But, you know, this sort of this high end usage down the field is exactly what we want a fantasy asset. The problem is Daniel Jones is getting pressure more than anyone. And as we saw on Monday night, you know, it's starting to get to the point where he's not even looking towards Darius Slayton because of the pressure. And he's just starting to go elsewhere. Where he's not seeing him brick wide open downfield. So, I mean, Slayton was cooking Jamel Dean, having success against Carlton Davis. I mean, this dude can get open against some of the league's best corners. He went over a hundred yards and two touchdowns against the Steelers in week one. We know he has these boom games in his, uh, you know, range of outcomes, but Sterling Shepard's back and he's eating a bunch of targets. Targets. Evan Ingram's back and he's eating targets. You know, Golden Tate, he had a nice touchdown at the end of the game, but he's more or less been phased out of this passing game just in terms of high usage uh, moments. But it's still a pretty crowded offense with three of these guys uh, kind of vying to be Daniel Jones' number one guy. So, you know, matchups where we think Daniel Jones can get some time, I'm more willing to kind of bet on it being the boom instead of the bust in Slayton's range of outcomes. But this week against the Washington football team defensive line that's just, you know, continuously full of monsters seemingly everywhere you look, I think I'm probably going to be passing on playing you know, pretty much any of these giants. Andrew, what's going on with Kyle Allen and the boys out of Washington? Yeah, Kyle Allen, you know, he put up a respectable day against the Giants last time they played. So you're in a two quarterback league and fire up Kyle Allen. I know I am. I can't wait to do it. But I think also as well, you know, George Kittle's out. So there's a lot of teams looking for tight end production. And Logan Thomas is someone that you can get off the waiver wire. He should be readily available coming off the team's bye week. But he's kind of enjoyed a renaissance of sorts with Kyle Allen under center. You know, during the first part of the season with Dwayne Haskins, his yards per route run was 0.58. And it's increased all the way up to 1.85 in the past two games. So again, we liked his usage throughout, but it was just inaccurate throws from Haskins that were absolutely nuking his fantasy value. But because Kyle Allen has come in and just provided just comparable quarterback play, that has now vaulted Logan Thomas into that tight end one conversation. Um, the last time they played, Thomas scored 13.2 fantasy points against the New York Giants, and the Giants have allowed the second most yards to tight ends over the past two weeks. So I like Logan Thomas in the spot. I also like Logan Thomas. Talked about him on the Tuesday edition of this podcast where we went. I went over some of the key waiver wire ads of the week. We can trust Logan Thomas a little bit more now that Kyle Allen is under center. And to your point, he has had the every down roll all season. Uh, before we keep on going, quick shout out to our sponsors at Monkey Knife Fight. All first time depositors at Monkey Knife Fight that put at least 20 bucks in their account while using promo code PFF will receive a free PFF Edge annual subscription. That's a $40 value for just 20 bucks, people. And you'll get the opportunity to turn that 20 bucks into even more money playing daily fans and prop games at one of the fastest growing fantasy sports sites in the USA and Monkey Knife Fight. So go to Monkey Knife Fight, deposit your $20 with code PFF today to receive your free PFF Edge annual subscription. What a deal. I can't get over it. Uh, next matchup, we got the Ravens at the Colts. Uh, Ravens open as three-point favorites, down a little bit to two and a half, uh, over under holding steady at four at 45. So Mark Ingram continuing to deal with this high ankle sprain. We kind of thought he'd be back after the bye. Wasn't the case. Doesn't seem like he's healing as fast you know, as they hoped. So we'll see. If he he comes back, it's going to be the muddled three down, you know, the three back committee we've kind of seen all season. I mean, this can't overstate how frustrating this has been uh, when it has been all three guys active. In weeks one through six, the only time that anybody had over even 12 touches in a game was Gus Edwards with 14 in, in week six. So literally, none of these guys are even usable if they're all healthy. But you take away Ingram. Justice Hill did not leap in and fill that role. And this was big because we can live with two RB backfields and fantasy. That's what the Ravens gave us in week eight. Uh, you know, 
Dobbins and, and Edwards finished the game with more than 15 touches. Dobbins was up there at 65% snaps because he is their kind of primary pass down back. But look, they're going to continue to feed Edwards on, on uh, you know, early downs in the run game. So look, they're both playing good. Dobbins has been clearly the best running back, I think, by eye test and by any of the advanced metrics you want to pull out. So the question is, can this Ravens offense, you know, with Lamar but without star left tackle Ronnie Stanley, continue to be kind of the world-beating rushing unit uh, that we've seen? I do think they're going to be fine, but this Colts rush defense, man, don't look now, but they're top four in yards before contact per attempt, explosive run play rate, and just yards per rush. I mean, truly, arguably, the number two run defense in the league behind only Tampa Bay. So I do think the Ravens, uh, you know, high-end run game will win out, but let's keep an eye on this unit because we know the passing has uh, come out a little bit slow uh, this season, and removing Stanley from the picture, uh, you know, if that really hurts the ability to run the ball, that could be problematic for the Ravens' chances at kind of putting things together and making a push for the playoffs. So uh, Dobbins, Edwards, I'm fine treating really both these guys as top 24 options this week if Ingram remains sidelined, but let's really keep an eye on how they look without Ronnie Stanley for the first week. Andrew, what is going on with Phillip Rivers and company? Yeah, Philip Rivers and company could have a better matchup on paper than we initially at- anticipate due to the fact that the Ravens are dealing with some some COVID outbreaks. So they've already put a couple guys on the COVID reserve list. They put on Marlon Humphrey earlier this week, and it looks like they just recently put on Deshaun Elliott, who's one of their safeties. So again, you got to keep this is a fluid situation, but if they're going to be down, you know, more and more guys, okay, you got to start looking at these Colts options a little bit more. So you look at Jordan Wilkins, who looks like he could be in time for a full-time role and potential if Jonathan Taylor is going to miss. Again, Taylor has kind of disappointed us this year. He hasn't been the same guy that we all, the highly touted guy coming out of Wisconsin. We all thought he was going to absolutely come in and smash expectations and just absolutely dominate. And really, you know, when you look down to it, he's actually really just met expectations. His fantasy points scored are actually exactly what his expectations are so far this season. So, but again, it comes with the caveat, you know, we all expected this guy to come in and just deliver all these huge running plays, which he just really hasn't done to this point. He's the RB21 overall on the year, RB25 points per game. So he's really been an RB2. But when you look at him compared to Wilkins, Wilkins has been, you know, really, really good. He's been straight balling. He, he's PFF rushing grade 15th. He ranks number one in the league in missed tackles forced per attempt, which is both significantly higher than, than Jonathan Taylor, who's 36th and ranks 48th out of 50 qualifying backs in missed tackles forced per attempt. So again, I don't mind Wilkins as a volume play if Jonathan Taylor's out. If they're both active, you probably can't start either of them because the Ravens run defense is just that good. You would just need at least the volume in one spot. So that's kind of my take there. Naeem Hines will probably be at least a flex play. Again, Phil Rivers absolutely loves to target the running back position. His target rate on routes run is 29.5%. So whenever Hines plays, Rivers is looking for him. And if the Ravens secondary, you know, maintains most of its starters and is strong, then he's going to have to find other options to throw the ball to because T.Y. Hilton, I don't imagine is going to suit up in this game. And one other thing to note as well, Zach Pascal operates out of the slot. Marley Humphrey's out. So they're going to, he's going to be going up against a backup corner. And that's a matchup that Zach Pascal should be able to win. Um, so he's an interesting guy if you need a wide receiver. Yeah, I think that's the right way to approach this backfield. It's not like Wilkins is just going to be taken over. If you look at the Colts' schedule, man, they literally have just have not had a neutral game script game since Marlon Mack uh, got you know hurt and was out in week one. They've either been up multiple scores entering the fourth quarter or they've been down multiple scores in the first half, and it's kind of turned into either a Wilkins or Hines game, a, a, cor- a Wilkins or Hines game accordingly. So yes, you know I'll admit that you know the top five kind of pipe dreams for Jonathan Taylor are over, but you know don't let one week against uh, you know a Lions. T- uh, defense where they were just kind of running all through him. Don't let that one week make you think that, you know, Jordan Wilkins is all of a sudden going to take control of this backfield. If Jonathan Taylor gets hurt, you know, and I know he has the ankle injury, that could change things, but uh, certainly do think it's going to continue to be this muddled three RB system more weeks than not. Okay, next matchup, we got the Lions at the Vikings. Vikings opened as two-point favorites. They are up two, four points. We have the over-under down from 55.5 to 52.5, perhaps, uh, in part part due to uh, Kenny Galladay being out with a hip injury. Uh, could be out several weeks here, but it does sound a little bit on the shorter uh, side of things. So with that in mind, it could be Marvin Jones wide receiver two season. We have had, you know, numerous examples uh, in 2020 and 2017 uh, when Kenny Galladay was just coming to the league of Marvin Jones uh, working without Kenny Galladay. So this year uh, in weeks one and two, you know, we saw him go four catches, 55 yards, and then four catches, 23 yards in the score. But we saw some true blow up games, you know, earlier in Kenny Galladay's rookie year. I understand, you know, 2020 Marvin Jones might not be the same.
same guy he was uh, three years ago. But we've also seen him come back strong enough after a pair of duds, you know, to kind of rule out the uh, talks that Marvin Jones is, you know, just this dusty washed version of himself. I mean, he could have had three touchdowns last week if Matthew Stafford kind of put the ball on him a little bit better. Uh, I, I believe it was their kind of last pass of the game. But Stafford, you know, he was out there trying to do his thing. He had blood pouring out of his hand up when he was trying to make that pass anyway. So I'll give him the benefit of the doubt there. But, you know, just realize I'm not saying Marvin Jones is Kenny Galladay, but he is now their number one wide receiver. And there's no, you know, if, ands, or buts about that. Marvin Hall, Danny Amendola, these guys are complimentary guys. It's the Marvin Jones show on the outside. And he gets a Viking secondary that, look, we try to keep this podcast to around 60 minutes. I don't have time to list all the injuries that the Vikings have in their secondary. And they're already pretty men against wide receivers in the first place. So after that, we get the Washington football team and then the Panthers. These are winnable matchups. So don't go crazy on Marvin Jones. You know, again, he's not Galladay. I'm not going to rank him in the top 10 or anything, but this guy could be a legit upside wide receiver too, as long as Kenny Galladay is sidelined. Andrew, what is up with uh, another team that has, you know, a pair of uh, talented wide receivers with the Vikings, Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen? Yeah, I love the Marvin Jones call just through the fact that, you know, we've seen some of these older players, you know, just take a little bit of time to get acclimated. You know, they didn't have the preseason to warm up. You know, they got to warm up the old joints. They got to get going. So that's Marvin Jones in, in a nutshell. But Flipping over to the Vikings side, the offensive players. Again, Dalvin Cook is a lock-button play, running back DFS, the Lions. A lot of the most fantasy points running backs this season, and that's just not a case of they, you know, they allowed a lot of fantasy points at the beginning of the year. It's been a steady, slow stream of fantasy points allowed. Six different running backs have scored 20 more fantasy points against them. So if you're playing DFS, you got to play Dalvin Cook. And yeah, that, that, that's pretty much that. But when it comes to the wide receiver position, I think that you have to have a little bit more confidence in Thielen and Justin Jefferson in this spot. Again, Dalvin Cook's not going to score 40 plus fantasy points every single week. So naturally, some of those fantasy players are going to have to, you know, trickle down to some of the other players. You know, they can get in on the fun. Um, but that's the thing about Thielen and Jefferson. You know, both their prices have dropped in DFS on DraftKings, and Cook is going to garner the most ownership. So I like them both as leverage plays because a lot of people won't play Cook, Jeff Jefferson, and Thielen kind of all together. Um, but you look at the Lions, their weakest part of their secondary in their defense is against big plays. The Lions have allowed the third highest explosive passing percentage this season and face the highest deep ball rate the wide receiver duo of Thielen and Jefferson has combined for 14 catches on tw targets of 20 or more yards downfield which is by far the highest pair of any wide receivers so far this season so I think that both of those guys are in really good spots and if you need a tight end streamer again Irv Smith had seen an uptick in usage of what, not t counting last week because it was just a very weird game script um, but the Lions have allowed the fifth most fantasy points to tight ends over the past two weeks so if you're desperate at tight end, or if Smith Jr. Could, could also fill in there. Yeah, Kirk Cousins, you know, we see them have games where they do get really high up on the scoreboard, but, you know, cautiously optimistic he will be throwing the ball more than 14 times here moving forward. I am with you. Continue to go back to well with both Thielen and Jefferson. Man, maybe even Irv Smith. We'll see. It would help so much if one of those Vikings tight ends could miss time. You don't, you don't want to risk, uh, you know, wish an injury on anybody, but it's truly like an Eagles situation where either of those guys could be a true tight end one if given the opportunity. Uh, Bears Titans up next here. We have the Titans opening up six and a half point favorites. That has dropped down to 50 to uh, five and a half uh, point favorites. The game total is sitting steady at 46 and a half. So I want to put a little bit of respect on uh, Dave Montgomery's name here. And I understand that he has not, you know, been your prototypical back where he's going to give you the so sort of explosive plays that, you know, you see from the Derrick Henry's and Christian McCaffrey's of the world. You know, he does a whole lot of effort sometimes to only pick up a few yards, but it's really just not his fault. Only the Jets have allowed, uh, I mean, have actually averaged, excuse me, only the Jets offensive line has averaged fewer yards before contact per rush than the Bears this season. I mean, there were multiple times in that Saints game where you saw Montgomery literally breaking multiple tackles, like only to get like five to eight yards. So yes, I understand part of that is that he doesn't have this burst and necessarily run away from guys after he does break tackles. But here we are through eight weeks and nobody has more total broken tackles than David Montgomery with 39. And it's not like he's doing it based purely on volume. His average of 0 0.27 broken tackles per touch ranks seventh among 53 backs with at least 50 touches. So doesn't have the burst, but the dude's making guys miss. And you know, he's just just been forced to make a ton of guys miss because they're constantly uh, running at him free as soon as he gets the ball. So since Tariq Cohen went down, uh, we've seen, let's see, five games with Dave Montgomery. He's at the following uh, weekly finishes. PPR RB 27, RB 13, RB 14, RB 24, and RB 19. He is the definition of a volume-induced RB 2. You know, he keeps getting fed, he keeps getting the snap rates, and they're not going anywhere. So until they do, until we see any sort of sign that Montgomery is going to be on the field for fewer than, you know, four-fifths of the offensive snaps, we need 
need to continue to treat him as the top 24 back that he's been for the last month without Tariq Cohen. Facing the Titans, 10th worst defense in the league in PPR points per game to RBs. You know, might might be icky, but, you know, Montgomery should continue to be in, you know, starting lineups and fantasy football leagues of most shapes and sizes. Andrew, Derrick Henry's a little bit more fun to talk about than uh, Montgomery, but doesn't have those broken tackles, man. Uh, obviously, we're still taking Henry in any way, shape, or form, but what's going on with the Titans? Yeah, I was disappointed when I you know looked at this game and I was like, oh man, winter's coming, baby. He's going to Chicago. But then I was like, oh man, it's 70 degrees in Tennessee. That's not what I want. But Derrick Henry should smash in this spot. Again, the Chicago Bears, you know, they have a, on paper, their run defense is, you know, kind of middle of the pack, but they rank dead last in explosive run percentage, 17.9%, and rushing plays allowed of 15 yards or more. So that's basically Derrick Henry's bread and butter, you know, baking, you know, breaking off these big runs, especially towards the end of games, because he ranks third in rushes of 10 or more and second in rushes of 15 or more yards this season. So, you know, Derrick Henry may be plodding along when you're the first, second, third quarter, but in the fourth quarter, when you see his fantasy points jump up, you know what happened. He he took one to the house, you know, 80 plus yards. So I think Derrick Henry's obviously in a good spot here. And if people are afraid of the Bears, then, well, you know, just play Derrick Henry. Uh, Johnny Smith at tight end has kind of been absent the last couple of weeks. I like him to bounce back, though, in this spot. Again, the Bears have allowed the seventh most fantasy points to tight ends over the past four weeks. And I think he benefits a lot from Adam Humphreys possibly missing this game. He scored 21 fantasy points the last time he played without Adam Humphreys earlier this season. And we're not really seeing a usage in, in John Lee Smith be the reason why he's not nearly seeing targets. Um, his routes run has basically kind of stayed the same. It's only dropped, you know, a couple routes it's not really made a really big difference in terms of what his output should actually be. So I think he should be in good, in good shape. And I think the best part about the matchup is the Bears have allowed the second most yards after the catch to tight ends this season. And that is Johnny Smith's. Uh, that's what he does best. And as always, contractually obligated to mention AJB wide receiver one season anytime we are going over the Titans. Uh, next matchup, we got the Panthers at the Chiefs. Chiefs open up as 10 point favorites, slightly rising to 10.5. And, and we have seen the over under go from 50.5 to 52.5. So with the Panthers, you know, Christian McCaffrey was really close to playing last Thursday night. He's had, you know, uh, the kind of mini bye week here with having that extended time up until Sunday. So it seems like he is going to be back in action. Now, will Mike Davis still have a role is kind of the question on everyone's mind. And my answer is no, he will not. Look, Mike Davis, he's right there tied. He's actually tied with David Montgomery in terms of total broken tackles this year. I was being a little bit misleading there to make my David Montgomery spiel sound better, but deal with it, everyone. Both these guys, both Mike Davis and David Montgomery deserve a little more respect. But you go back and look at these last few weeks, really wasn't the same, you know, kind of just frequent uh, high-end fantasy guy that we thought we were getting in Mike Davis. He averaged seven and a half receptions per game in weeks two through five, caught just eight passes total in weeks six through eight. And that's the thing that interests me most here about Christian McCaffrey coming back because look, he's going to be out there. He's played, you know, has not played fewer than 85% of the offensive snaps in a non-injury short or week 17 game since 2017. You know, Panthers have 64 million reasons to give McCaffrey all the touches he can handle. But this season, Teddy Bridgewater, his check down, I mean, excuse me, his passes to the RB on his first read have only been persisting at a 36% rate. Last year, Kyle Allen was at 54%. That's why Christian McCaffrey broke the receiving record, but it's not really great practice to be centering your entire passing offense around, you know, feeding your RB the second he gets past the line of scrimmage. So, you know, Panthers passing game, we've seen some ups and downs, but continuing to center that around DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson, I think is going to be better for Christian McCaffrey and for everybody because, you know, getting McCaffrey the ball, the ball more when the situation calls for it instead of trying to force feed it down his throat is going to be what's ultimately going to help this Panthers offense reach a higher level as a whole. Uh, Andrew, I know we got, you know, kind of sticky, iffy uh, running back situation in Kansas City as well. What's going on with the Chiefs offense? Yeah, so the Chiefs offense basically could do whatever they wanted last week against the Jets because, you know, their opponent wasn't really trying to win. So that's kind of what happens. But I kind of would revert some of their offensive production to kind of fall more into the running back position because last week they were playing to their strengths and to their opponent's weaknesses. You know, the Jets want teams to run against them because they have a good run defense. And the Chiefs are like, all right, fine, we'll just throw it and you'll lose. And that's exactly what happened. But the Carolina Panthers are kind of the opposite. The Panthers have a much stronger secondary, despite the fact that their personnel doesn't really jump off the page as having elite guys. They're going to be getting Russell Douglas back, who's been one of their best corners. And their defense has suffered without him the last couple weeks. But he's going to help them in the back end, along with some of their other talented guys. So I think that's going to help a lot in terms of limiting Patrick Mahomes. Again, this isn't a, hey, you know, bench Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, don't do that. But I'm saying that we may not see the same five touchdown game from Mahomes again and I think that 
be, could because of the running game for the Chiefs. I think they're going to use a little bit more of Edward Slay, a little bit more of Le'Veon Bell because the Panthers can't stop anything on the ground. That's their biggest weaknesses against the ground game. And that's also why that the Panthers, they and the reason why that they've struggled so much against the run game too is because they're protecting against the deep ball. And that's something that the Mahomes likes to do, but I don't think they're going to give him those looks. So he's going to have to check it down to the running backs. And that's why the Panthers have allowed the most catches to running backs this season, because they've allowed the fourth lowest deep ball percentage. So unless Mahomes is like, I don't care. I'm going to Superman this in, you know, triple cover Tyreek Hill. Don't, it doesn't matter. He's a smart guy. He'll check the ball down to his open running backs. And I think that Clyde Edwards, could probably make some noise. He makes, he ranks third in the NFL in total missed tackles for us this year. And the Panthers rank number one on defense in missed tackles. Yeah, very good points there about, you know, just the Chiefs being a smart team. Look, when it's a light box, they will run the ball. When it's a heavy box, they will pass the ball. I mean, 45% of Mahomes' pass attempts uh, were against loaded boxes with seven or more defenders last week. I mean, remember that Bills game where people were almost chastising the way the Bills were playing run defense? Well, only 8% of Mahomes' attempts were against a loaded box that, that week, and he had season low 26 pass attempts because of that. So the Panthers this year, 32% of their defense's dropbacks face have come against boxes featuring seven or more defenders. That is the fifth lowest mark in the league. I agree with you, Andrew. I do think we will see the Chiefs re-embrace that run game against a defense that is actually trying to, you know, do good things instead of just, you know, having this age-old football man, hey, we got to stop the run first, no matter what mentality that Greg Williams and the Jets have going on. So good stuff there. Next matchup, we got the Seahawks at the Bills. Uh, Seahawks open as one and a half point favorites. That is up to three over under down slightly from 55 to 54. So I just want to, you know, continue to not 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 to pat Russell Wilson on the back too hard because I think everyone's doing that in national media, but it truly is incredible that not only is Russ cooking more than ever, but he's doing it at a career high level. I mean, this is like a three-point shooter you know averaging five attempts per year getting a much bigger role and getting going up to eight or nine attempts and actually shooting a higher percentage than they were before despite teams now focusing on them more than ever right now russ is setting career high marks in pff passing grade yards per attempt completion rate adjusted completion rate and qb rating how his 37.1 rushing yards per game is the second highest mark of his career he is cooking as a passer and almost as a rusher better than we've ever seen so uh you know continue to obviously fire him up as you know the i, I have the number two this week behind Mahomes, but but, you know, after a couple of drinks, I could easily see him being number one by the end of the week. And look, I know there's been some concern about whether or not, you know, Metcalf and Lockett can ball out in the same week. Don't overthink this, guys. Like, I, Maybe it's a, you know, different discussion for, you know, DFS. We want to talk about when's the right time to stack Russell with both versus one. But Metcalf has literally scored and or racked up at least 90 receiving yards in every single game except the Cardinals dud. I mean, Lockett's been the one that's been fluctuating a little bit more. Don't think that, you know, Metcalf is kind of capable of having these down games as well. We saw it the one week against Patrick Peterson, but we saw that last year as well. I think Rush just really respects uh, Patrick Peterson from playing this division against him for so long. I mean, he just wasn't even really testing that matchup. So, look, Lockett, a little more iffy, a little more boomer bust, but we got three touchdown explosions as a reward when he does decide to boom. So, keep going back to well. Both these guys are top, you know, five, top six options at the position this week. Andrew, what's going on with Josh and Josh Allen and company? Yeah, Josh Allen hasn't been his usual self, or maybe he has been his usual self. He's not been easy. Very pr- <laughs> Take it easy. <laughs> he hasn't been as productive as he's been over the beginning of the season. Again, part of that's to do with some of the competition he's played. He's had some tougher matchups this during or more recently than he had during the beginning of the season. But part of the reason, you know, I pointed this out on our three high safeties that we did last week, where you know I was concerned about him without John Brown. Um, even though John Brown played. You know, it's still, you wonder if he's at 100%. Again, hopefully another week off of the injury helps him get back. And they're going to need him in this matchup against the Seattle Seahawks. So, I mean, if Josh Allen can't get it done here, I mean, again, this the Patriots made the Seahawks defense look bad. And their offense can't do anything right now. So you got to expect that Josh Allen is going to bounce back in the spot. He's still running the ball. So he's at, he has that rushing upside that you want. So, I mean, the Seahawks have allowed the second most fantasy points per game to opposing quarterbacks. And Nick Mullins scored 21 fantasy points in like a half against the Seahawks. So don't overthink it. You got to play Josh Allen. And I think that an advantage that they'll have here is especially because the Bills run 11 personnel, third highest rate in the NFL. Seattle ranks 31st and yards per attempt allowed 8.2 in defensive coverage against that personnel. So if John Brown is back to 100%, I think Josh Allen is going to be all firing on all cylinders in this matchup. I think John Brown is interesting as like a DFS play. You know, he did run a full complement of routes last week. He ran the same amount of routes as Stephon Diggs, and he's only 4,200 against the arguably the worst defense in the NFL, and he's a vertical threat. So uh, yeah, play John Brown. 
Yeah, quick context on Josh Allen's last three weeks. The week six game, you know, rainy against a Chiefs team that, again, was able to run the ball to their heart's desires and control the uh, control the clock the entire game. Only had 27 pass attempts. Week seven, can't find the end zone against the Jets, even though he throws for over 300 yards and racks up 60 on the ground. And week eight, only 18 pass attempts in another kind of bad weather game where the, you know, just Bills were playing with the lead and they were able to kind of run the ball uh, with Zach Moss and Devin Singletary. So, yeah, I think the Seahawks are going to be the team that are going to bring out that volume. And, you know, to your point, okay, Maybe the real Josh Allen isn't a good real-life quarterback, but we've seen enough evidence over the last three years to know that Josh Allen can and will continue to be a great fantasy football quarterback, and that is all we care about uh, when it comes down to our squads. Uh, next matchup here, Denver Broncos at the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, Falcons holding steady as four-point favorites over under up from 47 to 50. So Drew Locke is you know, kind of fulfilling his destiny here as an entertaining QB on a bad team that isn't a usable fantasy asset, but you know, as someone that sits here and watches every single game, game per week. Uh, you know, having Drew Locke under center instead of a lot of these other quarterbacks we've seen uh, is enlightening because right now Drew Locke with a 10.7 yard average target depth is, is the most, you know, aggressive gunslinger in the league in that metric. Kirk Cousins at 10 yards is the only other guy even in double digits right now. So look, Usually when he's throwing the ball downfield, bad things have happened. Right now, and through 10 career starts, Drew Locke has more turnover-worthy plays with 16 than he does big-time throws with only 14. But, uh, you know, a situation where, hey, maybe this Falcons defense could be the game for him where he gets another uh, solid performance. But we've now had 10 starts. We've seen exactly two viable fantasy games from Drew Locke. You know, the rushing floor, it looked like he might have in 2019, really hasn't come to fruition in 2020. A lot of his weapons are banged up. You know, again, and these other eight performances, he hasn't done anything. He's had one or zero scores and fewer than 255 passing yards so minimal ceiling as it is you know super low floor it's exciting i like watching drew lock i'm all in on the swag movement but it's entertaining it's not fancy viable people so you know maybe jerry judy uh but you know honestly if you want to just kind of just pass in this entire offense it makes sense because Noah Fant, he's losing a ton of targets to albert oh even though you know they're both kind of seeing a good amount in this backfield it's 50 50 right now so really enticing matchup against the falcons i understand this is a defense we want to target more times than not but you know, most start sick questions I'll get this week that have a Broncos player in it, I will most likely be going with the other guy. Andrew, what's up with Matt Ryan and the Falcons? Drew Locke and, and GPPs for the win. Oh, but my. Matt, but Matt Ryan, okay, so Matt Ryan, we traditionally struggles without Julio Jones. So it's a good thing that, you know, Calvin Ridley is the one that, you know, end up getting hurt. Again, I'm not anticipating Calvin Ridley to play in this game. They're talking like he's going to play, but, you know, Doing, you know, talking to our injury expert here at PFF and kind of looking, reading between the tea, lot, tea leaves, it's like, I don't think that he's going to go. So I'm kind of basing this analysis on the fact that he's not going to play in this game. And that's going to see an uptick in snaps for Christian Blake it's because the Falcons have something set up where they have a replacement directly behind each of their starting receivers. So Julio Jones, when he's out, it's Olamide Zacasa comes in. When Russell Gage is out, it's, it's Powell that comes in. And then Christian Blake comes in when Calvin Ridley misses time. So Christian Blake is an interesting guy. If you just are super desperate, you need a punt play in, in DFS or something like that, he can be fill in there. Uh, the Broncos secondary is not that good. But we would look at Russell Gage. He's probably someone that's a little bit more enticing, more on the radar. He's actually been fantasy relevant at times this season. Um, and he should see a boost in targets without Ridley in the lineup last year. Ridley missed three games. And Gage averaged seven targets per game over that time. And Gage is also a candidate for positive touchdown regression. You know, Robbie Anderson, Jarvis Landry, and Michael Gallup are the only other receivers this year that have more receiving yards than Gage and have just one receiving touchdown. So Matt Ryan, again, Calvin Ridley seemingly hogs all the touchdowns on the Atlanta Falcons. So you have to assume that Russell Gage might get one and maybe even Julio can get one. Julio, we saw he met three end zone targets, which seems like a career high for him. And of, of course he catches none of them. So I do think that Julio is actually in a kind of blow up spot here. Again, you know, citing back to last year's uh, splits without Ridley in the lineup during that three game stint, Jones averaged 26.7 fantasy points per game. So I love Julio this week, and I really like Russell Gage as well. Certainly seems like an occasion for Mount St. Julio to erupt. I like that call. Next game, we got the Raiders at the Chargers. Chargers open up as three-point favorites down to one-and-a-half-point favorites. Well, surprised to even see them favoring this game, honestly, to start the week. But that's the world we live in in the year 2020. Uh, Over-under from 56 is down to 53. So, look, you know, pretty much my week, you know, I kind of wake up on Monday, go throughout my business. Tuesday, I sit down and record this podcast. And I end up gushing over Derek Carr again and again and again because the guy is playing great ball. We're going to more 
more or less throw out last week's game against the Browns. I mean, the, just the weather game of all weather games kind of in the weather week uh, that we had there in week eight. So there was just, you know, not only just sideways uh, rain, but the wind was absurd as well. We didn't see Baker or Carr be able to do anything. And to Carr's credit, uh, he should have had a touchdown on that one. Henry Ruggs wasn't able to toe tap it uh, like he should have with the ball in his hands. But anyway, this year, career high QB rating for Derek Carr. I mean, he already has 12 big time throws after finishing 2019, which is 17. But in fantasy land, he's truly given us far more upside than we've seen in past years. You know, I've thrown this stat out on a few other podcasts, but I think it's worth stating again. He's had five games with at least 250 passing yards and multiple touchdowns this year. He only had four in 2019. He only had three in 2018 and 2017. So a situation where we've already seen him put together more big games than he has in the past three years in any one of those stretches. And now he's against the Chargers defense that could be losing Joey Bosa, depending on how the concussion protocol goes, uh, in addition to Derwin James and Chris Harris. So look, the Chargers last four games, the total point, to- the total points in these games have been 69, 57, 68, and 61. Like they are playing just shootouts one after another because Justin Herbert can put up points and, you know, their defense just isn't really able to stop uh, teams uh, for the time being. So uh, Derek Carr and company, look, it wasn't that long ago that they were just making the Chiefs look human in Arrowhead. So I really think this Raiders team is pretty legit, particularly on the offensive side of the ball. I have no reservations about them, you know, their ability to move the ball against the Chargers. Darren Waller is obviously the number one guy, but, you know, don't be surprised if we get a little bit of a Henry Ruggs coming out party perhaps. I think uh, this is a game where we could see Carr, you know, going for 300 plus multiple scores. And eventually we're going to see the Raiders, you know, first round rookie have one of these games that kind of proves just how talented he is. Andrew, what's going on with Justin Herbert and the Chargers? All right. So, yeah, Justin Herbert, absolute smash bot. This should be an absolute shootout. But I want to talk about the running back position. So since Justin Jackson has taken over as the team's leading running back in week five, he's averaged 14 fantasy points per game and 17 touches per game. So that was tapped off on in week eight when Jackson led the running backs in snaps, carries, and routes run. Now this guy, Tremaine Pope, came out and, you know, commanded seven targets kind of out of nowhere versus Jackson's five. But, you know, pun right there. But I don't think that Tremaine Pope is someone that's going to be, I mean, that seems really more like a fluke to me. You know, Jackson has been the pass catching back since Eckler went down. So I, I do anticipate Jackson, especially because he ran more routes. He will command, you know, more of the targets in this matchup. And it's a good spot. You know, the Raiders have allowed the fifth most fantasy points to the running back position this season. Joshua Kelly, you can probably drop at this point. It's just, you know, considering that Pope is kind of leapfrogged him as that, you know, potential early down grinder. I don't love Joshua Kelly and especially how, how ineffect, ineffective he has been and inefficient he's been rushing the ball this, this season. So I'm off on Joshua Kelly, on Justin Jackson. I'm kind of on Mike Williams as well. Mike Williams kind of came back to life a little bit. Last week he saw a lot of deep targets from Justin Herbert and it was just it was about time because it seemed like Jalen Guyton was getting all these deep target looks and just taking them all for touchdowns and it was like hey you know Mike Williams has to you know get in on the fun at some point and that's what we saw and the Raiders have really been bad against outside wide receivers this year they ranked 28th in yards per a target and 31st in quarterback rating allowed to perimeter wide receivers so I think that Mike Williams is another good spot to you know dominate here in this uh, matchup. In my opinion, Mike Williams is truly one of the most overqualified wide receiver twos in the NFL. Him and Keenan Allen should be talked about as wide receiver ones. They just so happen to be on the same team. Next matchup here, we got the Dolphins at the Cardinals. Arizona are four-point favorites. Game total sitting steady at 48. So, you know, talked about Tua's performance on the Monday uh, kind of recap pod, but 93 yards, scoreless, you know, got strip sacked on the first drive of the game. It was the second lowest graded game of week eight, only behind Jared Goff. And of the season, it was the second lowest among rookie QBs only when Joe Burrow uh, had to play that, you know, blitz happy Ravens defense and things went south quick. So look, it, it just this performance, there's very few good things to say about it. He had a five yard uh, average target depth. I mean, Fitzpatrick was sitting at 8.2 and that's pretty low for him even. So, you know, an already kind of more conservative Dolphins offense than I think we were expecting to see was just at the point where, you know, they were kind of struggling to even just get routine screens and stuff uh, to get downfield. So it was his first start. They were playing Aaron Donald. Like we knew this wasn't going to be a good matchup uh, for two on company, but you know, to see him just really not leaned on at all in the passing game, I understand the game script called for it, but we cannot give really anyone this passing game, you know, just the benefit of the doubt at this point until we see Tua put a little more uh, on film for us because his Cardinals defense, not that bad. I mean, when they lost Chandler Jones, I was kind of worried about what that would do to everyone else, but we're seeing Buda Baker really emerge as one of the best defensive players in the league, I think we can say at this point. So the dude's just a playmaker at all three levels of the defense, and you know, with Tua playing this way, I'm just concerned about anyone in this passing game, one, having the volume 
volume and two, having the efficiency to kind of go along with it. So one good news, I would say Isaiah Ford got traded to the Patriots and he's kind of been the reason why Mike Jasicki has been so inconsistent. They call, you know, the, technically Mike Jasicki is still a tight end, but he's played the overwhelming majority of his snaps in the slot and a little bit out wide over the past two seasons. So Ford was actually kind of splitting those snaps with Jasicki. Maybe it's a move to kind of get Antonio Callaway some more run as well. I think they'll continue to rotate wide receivers to uh, an extent. Jakeem Grant's out there, Preston Williams, Devontae Parker, obviously, but I do think the Ford trade is best news for Jasicki. Still not going the well with anyone other than Miles Gaskin this week as a legit, you know, guy that I would recommend starting for this Dolphins offense. Andrew, it's Chase Edmonds week. Probably. What's up yes, with the Cardinals? it is. But before we talk about Chase Edmonds' season, Ian, Miles Gaskin is out. He's out this week. No. Just came in three games with an MCL sprain. So oh. you need to retract your, your Miles Gaskin start. Matt Breida, Jordan Howard, and the Dolphins just traded for DeAndre Washington. I don't think that he can play in this game due to the fact of the new, you know, COVID testing. So, Ian, let's get, let's get your live take on Jordan Howard week or or Matt well, Breida or no one. I, I think it would be Matt Breida. We saw last week uh, with Gaskin. I'm, okay, over the past few weeks, Jordan Howard, all he was doing was being a true goal line vulture. And I've talked on this podcast about not liking that term because I think a lot of times uh, we overrate inside the five carries. It's usually just who's on the field. But truly in this offense, that was the role uh, that you know Jordan Howard was in. So last week, I mean, Gaskin was playing the early down, pass down, goal line role. He played 88% of the offense's snaps. But Matt Breida was number two back at 17%. Even something named Malcolm Perry. Perry was at 15%, you know, ahead of Jordan Howard. So I don't think Howard's going to do much of anything. He might come back and get that goal line role if they don't, you know, trust Brita to do it. But I would say Brita is the back to own uh, situation, though, where, you know, treat him more as like a Boston Scott type. Like we're not going to be firing him up as anything resembling a top 12 back. Uh, RB2 range, maybe. Calling him Boston Scott is probably even a little bit overhyping it. I would say, you know, just off the top of my head, I'll probably be ranking Brita as a top, you know, probably in that 25, 26 range. So I wouldn't go crazy with this fab. It's unfortunate, but, you know, look, it took a little bit for Gaskin to even get that three down roll. I'm not sure they think of any other back on this roster in the same light as Gaskin. Great breaking news update, Andrew. Great, good job by you. But now hit me with some goodness on the Cardinals. Yeah, and, and two, just you know, off the top again, I mentioned DeAndre Washington. So he's not going to be available to play in this game, most likely. But it's going to be a three-week injury. So you know, maybe they traded for DeAndre Washington for a reason. You know, they knew that they had a banged-up running back, so maybe he's depth. But if you have an extra roster spot, you can stash him. We've seen DeAndre, DeAndre Washington re look really good in a full-time role, which you haven't really seen Matt Breed and Jordan Howard do as of late. So okay, enough Dolphins talk. Finally, it's time to talk about Chase Edmonds' season, which is his time to shine. Uh, Kenyon Drake, you know, won't get his chance to have a revenge game against Miami because he won't be playing this week. But I mean, if you have Chase Edmonds, you're, you're locking him in, you know, he's going to be really a great play in DFS this week. Again, if you look at Edmonds over his career, when he's had at least 11 touches, he has averaged 18.1 PPR fantasy points per game. And something that I even like, this doesn't even have to do with Chase Edmonds. Something that came up earlier this week was the fact that the Cardinals are potentially getting back. PFF's highest graded run blocking tight end, Max Williams from 2019 season. And he was just activated off the IR. And he's honestly been a big reason why Kenyon Drake hasn't been as efficient as a rusher as he was at the end of last year when he was just absolutely melting faces uh, during the second half of the 2019 and leading teams to championships. And also you look at PFF's rushing grades, Drake's highest PFF rushing grade this season, 86.6 week one. Who played in that game? Max Williams. Boom, connected the dots, Ian. Absolutely love it. And so you also look at the Cardinals. So they lead the league in rushing attempts out of 12 personnel. So the two, two tight end sets. Dolphins rank 30th in yards per attempt allowed against 12 personnel and 31st in explosive run percentage. So Chase Edmonds, he's getting the targets. He's getting the carries. He's got the matchup. RB1, let's go. The Cardinals do use a lot of four wide receiver offense, but yes, to your point, I mean, it's a lot compared to the rest of the league. Their base offense is still very reliant on a tight end, so getting him back will be good news for Edmonds, and I think that entire uh, Kyler Murray-led Cardinals attack. Next matchup, we got the Steelers at the Cowboys. Steelers sitting pretty as 13.5 point favorites, and Jerry World over under is at 41.5, so I want to talk about James Conner, because this should be the blow-up game where, I mean, I haven't done my rankings yet. I usually do those Wednesday morning, but I think it's going to be a hard time getting James 
James Conner out of, you know, probably the top five this week because he's actually been playing now 80% of the offensive snaps in back-to-back weeks. He's gotten that true three-down workload that he really didn't have, uh, you know, weeks two through kind of six because we had, uh, you know, McFarlane, we had Benny Snell, we had uh, even Jalen Samuels still taking away a certain chunk of snaps. And it wasn't impacting Conner, but he had more of this, you know, 15 to 20 rush attempt role and just minimal usage in the pass game. It was more similar to, you know, Kenyon Drake and David Johnson than just that every down workhorse role that we saw from Le'Veon Bell, that we saw from James Conner in 2018. Even D'Angelo Williams when Le'Veon would miss time. It's just, you know, usually what we see with the Steelers is one guy out there as just the all-time running back, and Conner has been back to being that guy over the last two weeks. So look, Cowboys League single worst defense in yards before contact allows per rush. I was cracking up watching, you know, the Sunday night game with with a boss man, Chris Collins, uh, just talking about, you know, just it's, it's, it's almost like unbelievable how bad the Cowboys are against the run, just how many consistent chunk plays they give up and how inept they are uh, at just defending the run. So, you know, they cut a lot of their veteran defensive linemen that they signed in the offseason. They're expecting that to turn around. We've seen Leighton Vander Esch play a little bit better. They got Sean Lee back. Like, you know, Randy Gregory was doing some good things. They have some talent in the front seven, but man, like, okay, let's say even, let's say the defense makes a nice step up and t- t- makes life tough on the Steelers. Still a situation where, you know, they're going to have anyone's idea of positive game script because right now it's looking like Garrett Gilbert might be the favorite to start for the Cowboys. And look, I love my former AAF guys, but it's going to be him, Cooper Rush, Ben, you know, freaking Danichi. Who, who the hell knows, man? I don't even want to remember these guys' names because the offense is that much of a train wreck right now. So James Conner, anyone's idea of a top 10 back this week. And I think uh, once we get down to the exact running backs, he will be a top five option. Uh, all right, Andrew, keep it brief on the Cowboys, man, because I don't even want to talk about this train wreck of a team. Yeah, dude. So originally I wrote this up, you know, talking about Andy Dalton being under center and then he got COVID put on the COVID-19 list. So I was like, all right, got to re-edit, you know, put Ben DiNucci in, you know, how the targets can distribute that way. Okay. Now Ben DiNucci's bench for, you know, the combination of, of Cooper Rush and Garrett Gilbert. So again, you can't start Lamb. You can't start Gallup. You got to start Zeke just based on sheer volume. But again, you know, you have to have a real conversation with yourself in your lineup. And if you look at, okay, Zeke probably doesn't, Zeke doesn't have upside. He's playing the number one rushing defense with a quarterback that hasn't played. You know, we don't know. That doesn't have NFL experience. He's playing with a quarterback that arguably shouldn't be in the NFL at all. So, again, you can't. You don't have to feel like you have to start Zeke. Again, it's based on your situation. But, I mean, he's an RB2. I mean, I ranked him as like RB17 last week, and I felt like I was like crazy. And then the fact that he scored under 10 fantasy points again, it's like, it's probably going to be in that RB20 range again because it's like, okay, he's going to get the volume, but we don't know if he's going to get the targets. What's his touchdown upside? It's kind of not there. So, again, you got to be, you got to make tough decisions when it comes to Zeke. So, don't just lock him in and be like, no, yeah, I have to play him. Don't be a victim to the name because he's not the same guy that he's been, you know, these past years. And he's not the same. He doesn't have that top three potential at running back. And I think kind of goes the same thing with Amari Cooper. Again, a wide receiver one, he only had four targets last week. Again, I'm not chasing Michael Gallup's 12 targets. I would expect Cooper to at least lead the team in targets in this matchup. Again, the Steelers are more way more vulnerable against uh, wide receivers than the Eagles were, especially with Darius Slay in that secondary. So I'm okay with going back to Cooper, you know, as a you know wide receiver too, just because he has upside and the Steelers have given up a lot of big plays to the wide receiver position. Look, people, desperate times call for desperate measures. You've had Ezekiel Elliott sitting in that RB1, RB2 spot all season. Move him to the flex. Light a fire under this guy. Show your fantasy team that you are not taking this sort of production lightly. Make a statement to those guys. Get them to play hard for you down the second half stretch of the season. Uh, quick shout out to the boss man, Chris Collinsworth, because PFF and Sunday Night Football's Chris Collinsworth is teaming up with one of the best players on and off the field, 49ers All-Pro cornerback Richard Sherman. The Chris Collinsworth podcast featuring Richard Sherman is available now wherever you find your podcast. They will provide the most interesting football conversation in sports every single week, and sometimes that means the discussion will venture off the field too. Additionally, Chris will be taking a dive into the game of football as he sees it, inviting in the best and brightest to talk about everything that's happening in the great game of football. So mark your calendars. You do not want to miss the best 60 minutes of insight this season. Two more games, everyone. Thank you, as always, for listening to the Pro Football Focus Fantasy Football Podcast. We come with you live with, or not live, but you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday episodes. You 
got to love it. We got the Saints at the Buccaneers serving as our Sunday night football game. Quite an upgrade over uh, Cowboys Eagles as we were given uh, last week. We got the Buccaneers for open as four and a half point favorites up to five and a half over under is down from 55 and a half to 52. So, you know, looking at this Buccaneers defense, man, I'm just not really sure how the Saints offense is going to necessarily move this ball. And okay, hey, they got the win in week one, got a little bit of help from that pick six and also uh, just a situation where I think Brady and that offense were still Joan a little bit more than what we've seen now. So this year, the Buccaneers defense, I know they didn't look fantastic against the Giants, but we have anyone's idea of an elite pass rush, you know, top five in pressure rate this season after they just re-signed all their dudes that could have potentially left during the offseason. And they've almost like been unlucky, man, even though they've been this good because Buccaneers opponents have dropped just 3.7% of their targets against the squad. That's the fifth lowest mark in the league. So we could actually see some regression where opponents aren't coming down with everything that they are, uh, like they have been against this Buccaneers secondary, could make life even tougher. And just Breeze, man, season low, 160 yards in week one. We've seen him, you know, especially in outdoor games. You look at that Chicago performance where deep ball fluttering more than ever. This is going to be just his second game all year playing outdoors. And even if Michael Thomas comes back, I mean, we saw Carlton Davis eat his lunch, man. Only three catches for 17 yards against Davis. And I believe he didn't suffer the ankle injury till, until deep in the second half. So, you know, fact check me. Let me know if I'm wrong on that. But I just think that this matchup, the Buccaneers are very well suited to kind of thwart exactly what the Saints want to do. Best rush defense in the league by far. And I think with the pass rush and, uh, you know, with the secondary to be able to cause some problems against Michael Thomas and these guys, I have Breeze ranked, you know, outside of the top kind of 15 uh, quarterbacks this week. I, okay, I have him ranked uh, exactly as the QB 15, but, you know, don't be afraid if, you know, you're, you've been out there in a one QB league rolling with Breeze. I mean, there are streamer options like Matthew Stafford, like even Cam Newton, Derek Carr, Ryan Tannehill, all these guys I want in my lineup ahead of Drew Breeze this week. It's a Saints offense, and they do have a nice scoring floor, but uh, I just think this Buccaneers defense is for real, and, you know, in this outdoor matchup, I am, you know, pessimistic about what Breeze and company can do andrew what's going on with the buccaneers the buccaneers man it's the return of mr big chest himself antonio <laughs> brown oh he is, man he is back i did bench press reps today just because i was knew i was going to talk about him on the podcast <laughs> so i was really pumped about that took the, the dumbbells on a ride on the incline because he's back making his debut on Sunday Night Football, and he should be in your starting lineups this week. Again, the matchup, number one, is absolutely great. New Orleans Saints have been atrocious, basically the complete opposite of the Carolina Panthers. The, par the Panthers don't have great personnel, but have been really good against the pass. The Saints, you know, have a lot of notable names. You've got Malcolm Jenkins, Jack Rabbit J uh, J Jenkins, and um, Marshawn Lattimore. But all these guys have just been awful this year in terms of giving up fantasy points the most fantasy points allowed to the wide receiver position over the past four weeks and it's hard to not see the bucks showing off their new toy that has been living with tom brady the shower narrative could not be more real they're actually sharing uh, the same shower in his mansion in tampa so i think that the way that this is setting up is you know you watch that game on monday night you had Jaden Mickens running around the field. There's not enough guys to cover all these talented Tampa Bay Buccaneers wide receivers. So it's a pick your poison type of matchup. And however the Buccaneers decide to deploy their offense, it's going to go through. They're not going to be able to stop it. So I think that they're going to feature Antonio Brown. And I get that these reports come out with Bruce Arians where he's like, you know, he'll have his role. It could be 10 plays. It could be 35. I don't care what he says because it doesn't matter what he says because he just lies about everything. You know, Ronald Jones, man, the guy can't catch a break, dude. It was barely even a fumble. But it's like, oh, well, if the call in the field was a fumble, then it's then you're going to get benched. But if it wasn't, all right, then you'll stay in the game. But, you know, I digress when it comes to Ronald Jones. But, again, I'm not, you know, reading too much into this. Again, he's going to have a role. That's kind of what I see. So that's good. But, again, the last time we saw Tony Brown play, 57%. T uh, target rate on routes run in week two of last year with Tom Brady under center. He ran, he had eight targets on 14 routes. So again, Brady got him the ball. And the last time we saw Antonio Brown play a full game as a Pittsburgh Steeler was against the saints at the 2018 season. He went absolutely bonkers, 19 targets, 14 catches, 185 yards and two touchdowns. Marshawn Lattimore was good that year. He played in that game and Antonio Brown roasted him for five catches for 85 yards. So again, and that was under defensive coordinator Dennis Allen, same defensive coordinator now. So again, we don't know how long Antonio Brown is going to last, okay? We don't know. So if you have him, you need to play him this week. 
This is not an indictment on Chris Goblin and Mike Evans. Both of these guys are banged up. You know, Evans is trying to play through his ankle injury. We don't know if Goblin's going to be out there. Scotty Miller's toughing it out every week, and we're seeing him enter most of these games with a questionable designation. You're trying to tell me that the Buccaneers would go through all this bad PR, have to have all these meetings, have to go through all this stuff just to get Antonio Brown on their team. What, to play him 10 plays? 10 plays? Bruce Arians when half of your wide receiver room is on the injury report throughout the entire week? Get out of here. You know, I, I got a, you know some grief on Twitter for saying that you know I wouldn't be surprised with Antonio Brown having a true wide receiver one workload. But man, I think that's exactly how the stars are aligning. I'm with you. You know, I looked on Yahoo. I got my team and I see that you know eight point projection or whatever the hell they gave him. No, Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown needs to be in your lineup. He is going to be ranked well inside my top 20 wide receivers in Week Nine and quite a bit higher likely in Week Ten and beyond. Last matchup here at Monday night, we got the Patriots at the Jets. Jets, 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 Jets. Patriots are seven point favorites. Over under has gone up from 41 and a half to 42 and a half. So uh, the Patriots have made a trade for Isaiah Ford. That means their healthy wide receivers are, you know, Dolphin slot guy Isaiah Ford, who isn't bad by any stretch of the imagination. And then we got Demir Bird, who's been a career journeyman, field stretcher because he's fast, but we never really see him do much uh, down there. Jacoby Myers, who looks like their best wide receiver, which is just, you know, sad more than anything. Gunner, I don't know how to say your last name, and Isaiah Zuber. So, you know, Cam. It's the fantasy production. It's going to be there as long as he keeps his job, which, you know, it doesn't seem like that belt. Belichick understands what's happening. He literally had a quote out there this week, you know, saying that they made all these consecutive trips to the Super Bowl. You know, they just don't have the same personnel firepower as they've had in the past. I mean, switching from Cam to, uh, you know, Jared Stidham or Brian Hoyer is not going to solve anything. Cam has actually been more accurate than people give him credit for. He's had a top eight uh, mark this league just in terms of catchable deep ball rate around. It's just they, they can't create any big plays. If Cam, you know, is able to fire the ball and get, you know, 15, 20 yards. Like, these guys are never getting anything after the catch. Cam isn't, you know, without his blame, and he did play better last week after two fairly atrocious weeks, of, uh, uh, you know, against the Broncos and on the other game we saw. So I get it, but at least for fantasy purposes, and in this matchup, unless the Jets just continue to sell out completely against the run, which does scare me because we that does know what they do, I do think Cam can get back on track to a certain extent. So even with missing the game, he's still on pace to set career high marks and rush attempts with 148 and rushing touchdowns with 15. So, you know, it is a situation where I wonder, could the Jets keep this one a little bit closer just because their defense is actually pretty well suited to stop the Patriots? Because what defense isn't well suited to stop the Patriots? at this point but you know with Cam we honestly just kind of need him to get to 150 200 passing yards if he gets a touchdown through the air that's great but as long as he's getting these 50 plus rushing yards and finding the end zone more weeks than not on the ground he's going to keep being on that QB1 borderline not you know the weekly top 10 option that we were all hoping he would be at this point in the year but uh, you know I do think just his rushing usage will makes him uh, you know a, a prime streaming option this week against the Jets even though they do tend to sell out against a run more than anybody else and Andrew, anything, anything on the New York Football Jets? Well, well, first of all, so it's Gunnar Oshevsky. So, oh, and that's well how done. You, that's, that's, that's how you say his name. That's a professional it's, right there. Still Good don't know job. how to say Albert O's name, so that's that's besides the point. And Isaiah Ford out there moving lines, absolutely love it, man. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so the New York Jets again. This is like a slog of a game in terms of it's just going to be you know running and it's going to be not fun to watch. But from the Jets side of the ball, again, the Patriots invite teams. They're like, hey run the ball on us. Like, we want you to run the football. And so Frank Gore is probably going to have his usual six fantasy points. So if you just need six fantasy points, go get Frank Gore. Like, he'll do exactly that. I mean, Michael P. Ryan, again, kind of falls in that category. He's the de facto starter on the New York Jets offense. He plays more snaps than Frank Gore, but he's still not getting involved enough in the passing game where he actually could actually have value. So, again, they're both like low-end RB3s and really... I guess I would only put them in if you're like, you need like two points to win your matchup. It's like, all right, throw one of those guys in there. You can probably get two points from them because at least they're going to get some volume in a good matchup against a team. that's allowed the second most fantasy points to the running back position over the past four weeks. Jameson Crowder is probably the only like jets player that you've kind of started, you know, pretty frequently. Again, that's assuming that he's healthy, but in this matchup, I really don't like him. I think that you can get away from him. The Patriots have a lot of the third fewest fantasy points to the wide receiver position over the past four weeks. They still have Stephon Gilmore and Crowder has been kind of neutralized in past matchups against the, uh, the Patriots. The Jets slot wide receivers, just six catches for 51 yards in two games against New England in his past two matchups. So I don't like Jameson Crowder. 
Yeah, I have a rule where if a quarterback has admitted, you know, publicly or privately that they have seen ghosts against the defense they're facing, I'm not going to play that quarterback skill position players the next time those two teams meet up. So with you there, particularly with the health concerns uh, surrounding Crowder and some of those guys. All right, everyone, that's going to do it. Thank you, as always, for listening to the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I invite you to follow my friend Andrew Erickson on Twitter at Andrew Erickson underscore Andrew. You're coming out with all sorts of content during the week, man. What can the people find from you on PFF.com? Yeah, so we're going to have the review of high-value opportunities coming out this week. Got Stardom Sidham. Got the Fantasy Football Mailbag that I've been doing that's coming out on the weekend. So we post it on the PFF Instagram account, so make sure you go follow that, and you can ask a question for the mailbag, and I'll answer it. I only pick right right answers, so wrong answers only. So it should be fun, and yeah, make sure you go check it out. Good stuff, Andrew. And again, check out Andrew and myself on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio. I host the 5 to 7 Saturday show, Eastern Time, of course. Always Eastern Time. That is standard time, everybody. Andrew is on 7 to 9 on Sunday, and I always join him for the first two segments. So for Andrew, I'm Ian Harditz. Thank you again for listening to the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. And until next time, take care, everybody. Thanks for watching the PFF YouTube channel. And if you want to subscribe, all you have to do is push the button. Don't forget everything you get. A little fantasy, push the button. A little green line for the gambling aspects of the game, push the button. College football, push the button. The YouTube channel from PFF.